Hey everybody, welcome to uh, episode one of the original Game Changers, take two. I posted this and then I deleted it because I wanted to tweak it a little bit and add a few more slides, change some images and make some corrections that needed to be made. So this is the first episode in a series that I'm planning for you. Um, it's really going to highlight in this episode the Game Changers, those people who I've met over the years that I think have had a significant impact on myself, uh, mentors to myself, and great examples of people that have used a lot of these techniques I'll be talking about over the next few weeks and apply them and they're experts at their craft. So I wanted to entice you a little bit, show you a little bit about these people, um, and then um, end up with uh, a couple of testimonials, some recent people that I've helped, and then um, get back into uh, starting up another episode for you. And we'll try to do one a week so we can see if we can get this moving. Um, my whole goal is to try to keep these a little shorter. Um, if you were at the Sodbusters live stream, you know that was almost two and a half hours long. And I could have gone on for a couple more hours easily uh, with the stories and the stuff I wanted to share. So I think by breaking it down into these shorter videos, I think it'll make it easier for you all to digest. And I think it'll be more fun for everybody. So let's do this. Um, this first slide is just the Researcher Game Changer. It's our new YouTube channel that I just put together. I want to thank you, uh, those of you that have subscribed already, and hopefully if you enjoy this series, uh, you'll be subscribers as well. I, I would really be excited if you would join us. So a little bit more, and some of you don't know who I am. Uh, my name is Wayne Aguiar. I'm really a nobody on the internet. No one's really heard of me. I just started uh, officially on the internet, and I'll tell you that story. But I'm not new to detecting. I, when I was looking at this, I've been detecting for over 37 years now. Um, got started a long time ago with my dad, bought a detector, shared it for a little while, and that didn't, that didn't work very good because each wanted to detect, so each got detectors. Um, and then, you know, I've met a lot of nice people over the years, and I'm at a point now with my career that, you know, I've made a lot of good finds, and this isn't about me or, or what I found. It's really to highlight others and, and what I hope to achieve uh, now in my career, and that is to share uh, my experiences and I'm a university professor, so I'm an educator by profession, and I like teaching, and you'll see that I, I like presenting this information to you and sharing uh, stories. It seems like the stories have been really popular, so I want to continue to do that. Um, you know, I'm a member of a few different clubs, the Nutmeg Treasure Hunters is my home base, but also Yankee Territory Coin Shooters have been a home to me over the last couple of years. I joined the Empire State up in New York. Um, the other patch here is one that means a lot to me. It's a, it's a scouting one that is um, the sport of metal detecting. First time I've seen it referred to that on a patch. And that was up at the uh, Summit Betchel Reserve in West Virginia. The scouts actually uh, trained uh, in metal detecting, which I thought was awesome. And then the other patch I have on this screen is just the Federation patch. And that's just a big thank you to them because they've done a lot in support of detecting uh, particularly for us here in Connecticut, we had um, a move that was going on to try to ban uh, connecting, uh, detecting in Connecticut uh, in our town. And uh, I notified them and the, the president in particular was extremely supportive, contacted our town officials and really um, helped out in preventing that from happening. And hopefully we've um, stopped that uh, attempt now and, and hopefully it won't be coming back anytime soon. But uh, over the 37 years, I've not just been detecting, you know, I've done other things. I am really, I've been into fishing, uh, photography. Uh, and as I mentioned, scouting has been a big part of my life. And, and I have two boys uh, I'll mention during the, the series as well uh, that I've gotten involved in, in detecting and scouting. And, and it's been really great for me. So let's show you a little bit of what's going on here. This is Professor Wayne's world. Uh, this is where I work. This is generally where I sit. Uh, this is my home, my home office, a poor man's office. I'm actually using my wife's uh, scrapbooking table. She's been very generous to share with me. Um, I keep adding this equipment. Uh, just a breakdown on the equipment because it's, it's interesting to, to see what's here. I, I have a lot of gadgets and a lot of stuff going on here, but they each have a purpose and a function for me. The laptop I like because it's portable. I can take with me. If I go to the library, I can bring it with me. Uh, so it's really nice for that, you know, the portability of it. Um, people ask me, do you use Mac or PC? I use both. Uh, on the right-hand side is, uh, is a Mac. It's an older Mac, but it still does its job. Really, really good at uh, graphics. Uh, I use it for some of the podcast kind of conversions like Audacity, uh, Guitar Band, uh, iMovie. Uh, it's really great for all of those things. It's really great with graphics. 
Um, on the left-hand side is, is my newer edition. It's a desktop um, uh, system that I had purchased. And actually, since this picture was taken, I've upgraded it a little bit more. Uh, the one thing I've done is a wireless keyboard, smaller one, and also a, a larger monitor. And one of the recommendations I would make to anybody um, is to get the largest monitor that you can uh, fit in your space or you can afford, uh, because that extra space really comes in handy. You know, the one I'm using right now that I'm sitting in front of is a little bit bigger. It gives me a little bit more room to uh, maneuver. And, and, uh, and when I have multiple programs going on, and it's really nice to have that for the application. So uh, this is my world. This is my world. And it's similar to what I have at work. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm a professor at the University of Bridgeport. Uh, that's my main job. Um, and, you know, this is just something I do for fun. All right, a little bit of a, a history here, uh, because some of you don't know me and you haven't seen the other videos we've done. Uh, the story behind the Game Changers, and it started um, not that long ago. Um, a friend of mine uh, who had taught me some of the research techniques that I'm going to be sharing with you over the next few weeks um, had done, had done so with the idea that he was just training me. He didn't want to train a whole bunch of other people. And um, he wanted me to, 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 to benefit from it. And I really, really appreciated that. And then when I was thinking about it, there were so many other techniques that I, you know, I picked up over the years. And there's only one magic technique. I mean, there's a lot of good ones and there's things that you know, he specialized in. But there was a lot of other things. So I wanted to set up a site, and, and I've done that on the internet. It's a group site, a group training site, sharing site is what it's designed to be. Because there's this paradigm out there, and the paradigm is that people don't share, all right? If they have something, they found something, it's, it's kind of like a big secret. And I know many of you have seen this, because like if you're at a club meeting, and uh, you know people bring in this really cool stuff, and they'll say, like, oh, where did you find it? Uh, and they'll say, a park. All right, well, that doesn't really help you much. Or they say a beach. Okay, well, there's a lot of beaches out there. So where are you going? And people won't say. And, you know, I'm just kind of like the opposite. Like I invite everyone to go with me. I like to have company. I like to have the social aspect of it. I'm not afraid to share my sites. There's plenty of room out there. But I do get both perspectives. And I really do understand that. But what I'd like to do is kind of like break that rule of not sharing and get people to work together. Because can you imagine, like you put all of your experiences together, all these people with all this wealth of knowledge, and put that together and share uh, it would just, you know, play even out the playing field, because what I see at the meetings many times is people that are consistently winning, like, find of the month contests. It's the same people over and over again. I know they're using a lot of these uh, research techniques. They're not fooling me. I know what they're doing. Um, but, you know, it's not fair to those others that have no idea what's going on. So my idea was to uh, kind of like just share the knowledge that's out there. And, and then see what people can do with it. It's up to them if they want to take the time and learn it. It's out there. It's nothing magical. If you want to spend the time, you can learn how to do it. Um, my process right now is just to give back a little bit for my detecting community. Um, and, you know, and I'm just at that point in my career that I, I want to help other people right now. And that's my sincere desire. Uh, a disclaimer, uh, people that know some or all of the advanced techniques, as I said, uh, often prefer not to, to share them. They want to keep them as secrets. My analogy to that is like a, a magician. When you have mag magicians, you know, like they show you this awesome trick, but then they don't want to tell you like how they did the trick. That would kind of ruin the trick. Well, when you have people that are doing some really great detecting, uh, they also don't want to share how they did that great detecting because it would ruin their, you know, their finds of what they're doing that's so unique. Um, other people could also do that, but they won't share that. Uh, so my goal again is to provide an overview. I'm not. Don't worry. No worries. I will not give away all the secrets and details of your secrets if you're out there. Don't worry about that. Uh, I'm going to tell people about what kinds of stuff is out there, and if they want to learn it, they're welcome to learn it just as well as anybody else. They just have to make the effort. So my goal is to provide an overview of the research methods, and that's what I'll do over the next series of videos for you. Um, I do have a business, and this isn't an infomercial, but it is a business that I had created because I noticed that some people weren't inclined to learn the tools. They just weren't interested. I mean, they just want to detect and swing. I mean, time's a premium, and I totally get that. You know, we're all really busy. So if you can spend more time swinging or detecting and less time sitting in a library or researching, you know, I'm up at all kinds of hours of the night doing this kind of stuff. But I, I have a passion for it. I love doing it. There's some people that don't like doing that. And I, I noticed that on the internet, nobody was offering this service. And the service was to provide training, um, uh, not just for the, um, 
techniques. Some people want that, and, and that's what you know. Part of this is about. But others don't want the training. They just want you to give them a map. You know, give them, you know, give me an idea of what it is that you want to do, where you want to go, and I'll see what I can find for you in that area. And um, and people said, Wayne, you can get paid to do that. So I said, Well, that's pretty cool. So um, you know, I mean, when you look at it, it's like minimum wage with the number of hours I spent. But it's not about that. It's just about helping people like achieve and enjoy the hobby a little bit more. And, and if that helps them, it makes them happy, then it made me happy no matter what I'm, you know, charging or getting paid to do that. It's that's not the, the important part of it. This YouTube channel, I mean, I only have a few subscribers. I don't I just started. Uh, it'll probably take me years and years before I could ever monetize this channel. So that's not, you know, the purpose of this right now. It's just really to share with you guys, what, what and gals, and ladies, and gentlemen, um, what's going on with that. So th there's really two groups. I'm, I'm catering to one group that just wants the stuff done for them, which is fine. And then the other group that knows something, and maybe they know even more than I do, but they maybe want to learn a few new techniques or, or you know, there's always something to learn. You know, it makes me laugh when people think they know it all, you know, that, that doesn't really sit well with me when they're kind of pompous about it or kind of bragging about what they know, because I, I know that nobody knows it all. And personally, I feel like I learned something every time I go detecting, I purposely try to learn something new. And there's all these new techniques I've been hearing about and trying and learning more about and trying to, uh, you know, refine the, 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 the techniques to make them better and better. Uh, and it's just like, that's what keeps it really interesting to me. And that's what I want to share with people. Um, so I truly believe that using these research tools that I'm going to share with you over the next few weeks are going to uh, put the odds in your favor of the Hunger Games. Um, I cannot promise you treasure. That's not something I'm here to do. Uh, I'll show you what people have uh, done with these tools. And that's what today's uh, video episode one is, is to show you some game changers, some amazing detectorists. And I want to preface this, that these aren't necessarily the best and the only detectors out there that are doing this kind of stuff. There's a lot of people out there, you know, I've met over the last 37 years and even more recently in our Facebook group uh, that we formed the Game Changers. There's some amazing talent there. And I can't shout you all out. And I know that, you know, there's people out there that's doing some really good stuff and I've seen it. Um, so please don't be offended that I don't talk about you today or bring up your skills and, and your expertise. Uh, you know who you are and you know what, you can, what you've accomplished. And uh, I'm sure many of you are very humble and, and, and you wouldn't brag about it anyway. And in fact, the two people I picked today um, are people that I've worked with closely over the last few years anyway. And one of the things I found is that they're also very humble and I'm attracted to people like that. Uh, because it, it's so nice to work with them. You know, it's not about other, it's not about me. It's about, you know, others. And I really, really like that about these these uh, people that I'm going to share with you today. And then I'll, I'll end with a couple of uh, testimonials, uh, recent people that we've applied and, and taught some of these techniques to and what the effect has been for them. So um, that's where we're going. So um, let's get started. Uh, I hope you find it's a game changer. At the end of this whole series, I hope you can text me or uh, message me and say, yeah, Wayne, you know, I, I did get something out of this because that's what this is about. It's, it's making it worth your while and your time. All right. So the original, what I call him is my original game changer and uh, definitely one of my mentors because every time I detect with him, I feel like I learned something. And I, I often feel like I ask him too many questions because I'm always asking him questions and I might drive him crazy because he's a quiet kind of guy too. But um, he, he always responds and he's always, you know, willing to lend a hand and, and uh, he really, really is an outstanding person. So let me, let me just tell you a little story. Uh, the other day we were just talking about coppers and, you know, finding coppers and stuff. And he said that, well, over the years he's collected and he pulled out a drawer, I guess, and he counted them because he had just accumulated them. And there was over 400 coppers collected over the years by him, which is just amazing to me because I can't imagine collecting 400 coppers in my whole career. And he's just done this over his years of doing this. And I asked him, I said, you know, how long have you been doing this? <clears throat> and he responded, 54 years. Now, that's, you know, crazy. Like, I, I thought 37 years was a lot of time. Uh, he started when he was eight years old, and he's been uh, detecting ever since. You know, he's used all kinds of different detectors and stuff, but he's just mastered the craft. He's really, he lives detecting. I mean, it's like 24-7. Uh, this guy is just totally amazing. And um, he's found all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's uh, obviously coppers are one of the things everybody loves to find if you're doing uh, deep woods and cellar flows, that type of stuff. But he's found thousands, literally thousands of buttons, assorted colonials, flat, dandy buttons, 
Uh, and buttons are my actual favorite. Uh, I know coins are really cool and I never turned down a coin for sure. But buttons are really kind of cool too because they can tell you so much. And they're also beautiful. They're ornate. They're wonderful designs. There's so much history behind them. So historical significance. Um, and you can see examples of some of the dandies and the designs. Um, you, know, you know, there's just so much with buttons. There's so much history. It's, it's just fascinating. I absolutely love it. And then um, it's not just buttons for him. I'll come back to buttons in a little bit, but also like shoe buckles, these colonial shoe buckles. If you look at these, they're just like unbelievable uh, craftsmanship design. You can see like the detail in these. And many of these are complete blood, um, belt um, shoe buckles that you'll see. Um, actually, for me, I know this isn't talking about my stuff, but I'm going to mention one thing. When I went detecting with him one time, uh, we went to one of his sites and it had been, um, we, hopefully it was going to be a, a good site, but there was some evidence that it had been hunted before. So we didn't have our hopes really high, but I got there and I actually found one of my first complete uh, buckles. And, you know, a lot of times you find buckles and they're like pieces, they're broken, but to find a complete one was something special. And I had found it not really at the cellar hole itself, but off the cellar hole site a little bit, we kind of like wandered off. And he was kind of amazed where I found it because it was, it was quite a bit of ways. But he came over and he was so like happy for me. He wasn't jealous or anything like that. He's found so many. But to find one, you know, like that for me was really special. And I got really excited. And the fact that he was happy for me made me really even more excited because uh, this was a really great find for me. And, you know, he, he pulls out a drawer in his, in his house and I'm sure he's got multiple drawers everywhere. And you can see the collection here. I mean, they're not necessarily like uh, a high value here. There's, there's no like uh, fortune here. This is our, these are things that are more historical significance and collectible. I mean, a whole box with uh, chrono bells, they're beautiful. Uh, they're so fun to find. The horse tack and stuff that you find, you know, typically around the farms and the fields and so forth. And then the assorted you know, hinges and all kinds of stuff that you find. It's just beautiful collection. I mean, historically, it's just like amazing stuff. Really amazing stuff. And then again, he started displaying his buckles really nicely. He's got a nice display here. Oh, it's beautiful. And then uh, he, he showed me this. He sent me this picture, which I thought was kind of cool because um, someone in our in our group, we, we have a group of people that we detect with regularly and they had found something and they weren't sure what it is. And the nice thing, one thing about this guy is that you find something, you're not sure what it is. You ask him and he's like, oh, that's what it is. And he's like, it's amazing. It's amazing what he's able to do with it. It's just like crazy amazing. That, and what, um, what happened was I showed this uh, picture, this image to some of my friends and they were like, oh my God, I can't believe how many variations of suspender um, you know, uh, buckles there are. It's just like so many different types and uh, it's just amazing. It's really, really cool. Uh, so historically, I, I mean, these are just really, really interesting what you find. Now, th these are uh, more buttons that he's found more recently. Uh, he's putting them in together like a display. Uh, something that you could put into a, like a collecting box. I'll show you some of those boxes a little bit later, but it's such a beautiful display that he's got going here, all the different colors and sizes and designs. It's, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And I, I don't know if I mentioned it already, but recently he found, uh, first time, very recently, uh, a different kind of a, uh, a button, a button that was an oval shape. Usually they're circular, uh, sometimes they're handmade, and sometimes they're punched out, the machine made. Uh, but this one was really unique in the fact that it was oval and still had a nice pattern and design around it. But for him, that was a first, and he was pretty excited about that. And so to see him after you know 54 years of doing this, still getting excited over a simple button find is, is pretty cool. I included this chart and there's other charts too. And if you're interested, you can personal message me and I'll send you some other charts that I've collected. I, I can't give the source of this because I, I honestly don't know who originally created this, this beautiful little diagram. And some of you probably have it already. Um, but I posted it because the other thing that I like about buttons is they also give you an indication of the age of a site because it's a lot different than when you, you know, you're driving down the street and you find and you drive by a house and it says like circa 1700, circa 1800, and you know what you're dealing with. But when you go into the deep woods or you're finding these cellar holes in nowhere's land and you find these, you don't know what, how old they are. You really don't. And you have to use clues to kind of figure that out. Well, if you find a coin and it's not toasted so bad that you can't read the date, that'll help. Um, but when you find buttons, that can also help. It can give you an you know, a, approximate age of what the site might be because that's where people were losing these buttons. So I love this because it does give you that in indication. It, it also helps you to identify them. So it's a nice starting point. So check this out. Um, this is really available on Google. You just type 
dating buttons, dating colonial buttons, and it'll pop up as, as one of the images that you can see. And like I said, there's others. There's actually another one that I should have posted here that on military buttons that I thought was very helpful that uh, helped me more recently. So there is other charts as well, especially for the military. Uh, I just gave you some examples here, the big dandy and, and you know some other colonial buttons that he's found. But those special ones to me, and I, I put it here is the uh, military. And where I am in New England, we deal mostly with uh, French and Indian War of 1812 and the Revolutionary War. Those are the big ones that we would see for military type buttons. Now, we don't get to see the, the Civil War stuff very rarely here. I, I've only found like one button, I think that was Civil War in Connecticut. And I know people find a lot more and find some really cool stuff I'll show you. But typically, we don't see a whole lot of Civil War stuff. So we, we go more on the uh, revolutionary and, and that kind of stuff, colonial. But um, just to find a military button, I think is just like so cool. Um, and, you know, we have a major button factory here in Connecticut, in Waterbury, uh, Connecticut. In fact, a lot of the buttons on the back of them say Waterbury on them. So it's always cool to turn it over and see that. Um, but identifying these and just the, the historical significance, but also the meaning behind this. These are people that served uh, for the country, many times gave their life for the country. So they have a special meaning to me whenever you find military buttons. They're just so cool. Okay, this is a, a new slide. I, in my second version of this uh, video episode for you, I, I added a couple of stuff because I wanted to, you know, embellish it a little bit. And I, I added a little part about this with George Washington. So on April 30th, I'll just read it. On April 30th, 1789, George Washington made history, becoming the first president of the United States. And then soon after being sworn in, George Washington's inauguration as president inspired enterprising craftsmen to make and sell a variety of commemorative buttons and patriotic designs. There's like so many different George Washington buttons that were created over the years after his inauguration um, to represent that, that, that event. And this is just a sampling of them here. And there's some very common ones here. And this is on many people's bucket lists. And, and a lot of my friends have actually found them. Um, the, the gentleman here that I've been talking about, uh, I know he's found several. Uh, he's done really well with it. He actually found an entire set one time. Um, Usually they sold these in a group of six. That's how they marketed them. And it was usually to line a coat or a, a jacket. And um, I believe what happened in his case was that um, he was detecting in a field and he found one button and he was pretty excited. I believe it was the eagle design. And then he found another one and he's like, oh my God, this is like crazy. There might be even more. And he kept going and he found all six. So our guess and our best guess is that somebody was wearing a jacket out in the field, left it in the field, forgot about it and never picked it up. And then over time, the jacket disintegrated. I mean, it got buried over time. And then uh, now when he was detecting, he just happened to be in the right field at the right time and he found the jacket with six of them. So it's like six bucket listers in one shot. That's pretty cool. I thought I found one one time, right? And it looked like the eagle and, I, and this one when they represented the eagle. And I showed my friends and they're like, Wayne, you're like imagining it. You know, like there's no, there's no bird on that, on that button. And, and I have tried different things, different angles and different pictures, but I, 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 maybe it was just wishful thinking on my part, but it's the closest thing I've ever found of uh, getting one. So that's still on my bucket list. And, and I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, these are again, some assorted George Washington buttons and different things. Um, like I said, this gentleman's found several of them and they're really beautiful designs. And, um, you know, some of these you see, you may have seen posted before they're on the Facebook, other people have found them. Uh, one in particular that I like to talk about is this one here on the bottom right corner. It is one that he's found and is quite rare. And um, when you find one like this, um, what makes it rare is the fact that it's handmade. There's not a lot of them. Uh, the rarity scale is uh, way up there in terms of it's pretty rare and it's, it's a valuable button to find. But um, one of the things is when you have this one and it has like a little hat. And if you look at one that's in really good shape, you'll actually see the word liberty written across this hat band right there. And that's what gives it some really unique uh, properties. And I know in auctions, they've gone for a lot of money that they really are worth a lot of money. Uh, but just the collecting interest and the historic interest is, is just wonderful about these. These are just like a remarkable stuff, really, really cool stuff. Um, now this button I wanted to bring up because I know it's been posted and it's on the internet. Uh, I went crazy with this button, trying to research it to find more about it. And you look at it, it looks like pretty much a toasted button. You might not give it a second look, but you have to think about this a little bit and look at it really clear, carefully. And if you look at the one, the image on the left, the, the top side of it, it, it has an L-I 
B-E-R-T-Y. So it spells liberty. Now that's like, I don't know about you, but that's pretty cool. And when I first saw this, I'd never heard of anything like this. And, and I went like nuts researching it. Uh, he actually gave me a reference of someone that um, had knew something about this. And it turns out that it's, it was probably a, a patriot, um, a supporter of the colonial uh, cause. And they, they handmade this button. Uh, it has a rarity level of R7, which I didn't know what that meant. But from what I understand, an R7 means that only one or two of these are known to exist. So that is a pretty cool find. Um, and he found one. So that's pretty, pretty wonderful that he did that. Um, so that's pretty cool. All right. So now for a different style game changer. OK, now we're switching gears a little bit. Uh, the gentleman I just uh, showed you has spent a lot of time, definitely a lot of time uh, in the woods. Uh, we're not talking about like walking down a trail and then looking at a cellar hole on the trail. We're talking about bushwhacking. And when I go out with him, it's like an adventure. You almost like you have to train to go out with him because uh, we're, we're talking about going through backwoods, bushwhacking. Um, it was embarrassing. I'll tell you that I'll embarrass myself. The first time I went with him, I felt like a newbie. And I've been doing this for quite a while. I didn't think anything of it. I was saying, where's the trail? He says, what trail? We're not doing any trails. We're bushwhacking. I was like, okay, that's a different kind of hike for me. And um, embarrassment for me is that I stuck my foot in the mud. We were going through swamp and I walked through a swamp and my, I, I wore the wrong shoes for sure. And my shoe got stuck in the mud and he could have just laughed at me and left me there, but he came over, he pulled my shoe out of the mud. So I put my muddy shoe back on and we continued. And then I fell to add insult to injury. I fell and I ended up, I was wearing my headphones, which was a real mistake. And I learned from that. Don't wear your headphones, put them in a backpack so you don't have that you know, risk. And I damaged my, my headphones. I actually broke my headphones. So that was not a fun occurrence. The rest of the day was simply amazing. It's probably the best detecting day I can ever remember uh, in terms of fines and what we did. But um, again, uh, some embarrassing moments and I was humbled. Uh, like I was a newbie out there just starting off all over again in a whole nother world. And it's like uh, the Indiana Jones of detecting. This guy is just incredible. But now this is a different kind of game changer. Uh, this guy does the same kind of stuff. He does woods, he does cellar holes, he's done all that. But he's added a new element, I think. Uh, the other element is uh, personal permissions, uh, things like that, private permissions, and also um, um, parks. He, and one of his favorite places, and I think it's over the last you know, 20, 30 years he's been doing this, uh, is, is in a park. And they all, it's funny because a lot of people just refer to it as the park or they refer to it as his park, okay? It's because like he spent so much time there. We're talking like 800 acres, the place is huge. It's got a huge history and it's been producing and I'll show you what it's been producing. About 75% of the coins that you see in this picture probably came from that park last year. So in 2021, he set a record for himself. He spent a lot of time detecting, so that doesn't hurt, but you know, he's a diehard. He detects 24 seven, you know, like around the year, all 365 days a year, the weather does not matter. Uh, he will be detecting and it shows i mean look at what he found 189 silvers in one year that's amazing uh, by anyone's standards i'm sure that's that's pretty pretty good and he's so humble and he said to me wayne you know I'm like i didn't do as well as my friend and i was like as well as your friend and he says yeah he's a he's a silver magnet this guy is just like incredible and he's tall and this other guy is incredible and he got over 200, um, I want to say it was 230, something like that, 230 silvers. And they're hunting buddies. They spent a lot of time. I got to hunt with them a couple of times. So they're, they're really nice people, really nice guys. And um, between the two of them, almost 400 pieces of silver in one year. And that's just simply amazing. I mean, amazing. But what he does with them also is amazing. He's, he's an artist. I, I think this is like beautiful. You know, this is a Riker box. Um, he, he actually sells these. I bought a couple of them uh, from him. He's very reasonable uh, to put displays in because it makes it look really pretty, I think. And he does this uh, at the end of the year to kind of like celebrate the year. And then he takes all of these. And what he does is he, he files them and he puts them into these books. And a lot of you have seen or have maybe the coin collecting books that they sell. Well, he made his own. So he's got like several of these blue binders, you know, two, three inch binders, three ring binders with all these coin pages. And he just puts them as he finds them, he categorizes them. He's extremely particular about like organization of everything that he finds. It's all in its place. 
The funny thing here is that there's a blank spot here. So this is probably a coin that's like a really difficult coin to find. Uh, and it's still probably on his bucket list to find. So that's that's kind of kind of cool. When you go through his book and you see it like it isn't empty, you know that there's probably something like a, a really special coin that he's still looking for. But how I met him, the interesting thing here is how I met him was, this is a, a little ways back now, uh, I had bought a, a White's detector and it was a White's DFX. And I really liked the detector. It was, I think it was light years ahead of its time. And a, a good friend of mine, uh, one of my best friends uh, used one and, and he convinced me that it was a good thing to try and I, and I bought it. But then, you know, as soon as you buy a detector, you need like accessories. So I, I was looking for a big coil because I knew a lot of field work and I wanted a big coil. So my friend says, I know this guy, he was using a DFX and he was going to uh, get rid of it. And he had some coils for sale. So I said, okay, let's go check it out. So he brought me over to his house and that's what you're looking at here. And I went actually for this big coil but he also had the sniper, the little coil, and he had his old coil. This is like the original DFX coil. The funny thing about this, if you look at the ears on this, they're really almost like worn out because he used the detector so much that he wore out the ears. He just threw that in as a backup you know, coil for me. He didn't charge me anything for it, he just threw it in. The other thing he threw in that I thought was like remarkable and I had heard about but never used was this um, Sunray. Uh, it's a pinpointer. It's one of those uh, automatic pinpointers that plugs into your detector. So instead of like a handheld carrot or, you know, like the regular pinpointers, this is actually cabled directly to your detector. So when you're using it, if you've never seen this before, it's really kind of cool because when you use it, it actually gives you a reading. So you get the numbers as well. So you can see where you're at in the hole. Uh, and adds a little bit of extra weight to the detector itself, but you know it's it's not so uh, prohibitive uh, that you would want to use it. So I, I I got this, and it was really cool. It's a really neat neat accessory. And he threw it in with the deal, so I was like, he couldn't go wrong. And then he said, well, you know, do you you want to come see my collection? And I said, sure, absolutely. So we went downstairs, and he, he pulled out like some of these books, and he's I know he has several of them. Uh, you know, a good amount of what he has is you know he, he keeps locked up because it's it's just the uh, safety part of it. But uh, he brought out some stuff to show us. And then he showed us like uh, in his basement is like the ultimate uh, man cave when we were down there. And I said to him, you, if it's OK, can I just take some pictures? Because, you know, when I leave here, no one's ever going to believe me what I saw. Because when I when I was down there, I was like in a detector museum. That's, uh, the, you know, it's just like unbelievable. And let me just share with you some of the slides that, uh, as we go along. This is an example of how he categorizes them. He dates them, puts them in all the different denominations, all the different types, and, uh, many silver. He, silver is his specialty for sure. Uh, he's gotten a lot of silver. Uh, again, collections of what he's found. Uh, he's found some unique things. He's found counterfeits um, that, that they look like they're real, but when you actually test them, they're, they're not. He's found some really cool stuff like that. So he's found all kinds of stuff. Um, not just coins. I mean, as I said, he does parks and permissions and he, he goes all over, he's done everything. Um, he's done beaches as well. He does a little bit of everything. So he found like a lot of different things like toys and, and make these toy guns. Uh, he's found real guns. Now in Connecticut, if you find a real gun, you need to report it. You're supposed to report it to the police because that, if that was used in a crime, they want to identify that gun. So we work with the police here for lots of different things. We actually help them sometimes looking for bullets. But um, uh, some of the guns he's found are just like so old. They're like colonial era guns that, you know, has no chance of tying it into a crime today so he's kept these things and i know he's got derringers and pocket pistols he's got like all kinds of stuff he, he's actually got a derringer i think that's kind of cool like when you press the uh, trigger on the on the derringer it's like a lighter so it, it's like a cigarette lighter which is kind of cool you never see stuff like that um pocket knives you know literally you know they look toasted and they are but you got to figure that these are like 100 200 years old you know and considering their age uh, and just the fact that they're even preserved to this point is pretty amazing, but he just lays out everything so perfectly. It's just really, really cool. And then uh, like matchbox cars, like uh, Hot Wheels, is it whatever, the, um, the kids' toys, like if you detect anywhere, parks, beaches, wherever, you're gonna find a lot of these things. Well, he was running out of room to, to put everything. So he told me what he did was he converted a closet into a showcase. So he made these shelves and put the shelves and he has drawers underneath this actually and all kinds of different cars and toys that he's found. And he loves vehicles, he loves cars. Uh, he actually restores cars and he's a, a specialist at, at van restorations. Uh, that's one of his specialties. He told me he's got like multiple trophies, uh, like 40, 50 or more trophies. He's got tons of trophies. He's been on TV a few times because of his vans and his, uh, what he's done with them is you know, amazing. In fact, after we left his basement, we spent an hour looking at his van, which is just like unbelievable. 
other toys that like again more historic toys uh, the, the the coolest thing to me here is this little story with this horse in the background it's not the greatest picture but the, the horse you get the idea uh, he keeps going back to this park it's one of his favorite parks and he keeps finding different pieces of this horse so it seems it seems like every time he goes back he finds like another piece like a part of a leg or another piece he's got the rider and he's been assembling this and he's really good he's mechanically inclined and he's really good at putting things back together so he's been assembling this so i i think pretty soon you'll see like a complete horse pictured here it'll be kind of neat i'm sure he's probably looking for the head on his soldier somewhere it's out there but you can imagine like all these things i mean they're pretty large so the signals are going to be massive so they're not like your typical silver high numbers uh, sim, uh, tones that he's going to get but his his basic premise is if it's a repeatable sound uh, he's going to dig it and even if it's a scratchy sound but repeatable he, he's going to dig it and so many times he's been rewarded by that by these real interesting things uh, again religious uh, artifacts again depending on where you go if you go to places where there, there was a lot of um, religious activity, obviously, uh, you're more apt to find this kind of stuff. I got another slide of, of a collection of things that he's found or other people have found. Um, one of my favorites on here is the, is the thimbles, though, on the side. And you notice all different shapes and sizes, and many of them are uh, sterling, they're silver. Uh, he's also very good at um, repairing them, so when they get dented. And, and many of these actually came from fields, which I thought was intriguing, because you, you find them out in the field, you know, I think of thimbles, I think of sewing. I don't think of um, necessarily fields. So maybe around the cellar hole, you might find them if someone was sewing over there. But in the middle of a field, you don't think of it. But somewhere I remember researching this and I, I found that they said that sometimes people that would harvest the crops would actually wear uh, thimbles on their fingers uh, to protect their fingers from getting gnawed up from you know picking and, and, and um, harvesting the crops. So that might be some reason that they come in all these different sizes, like you know, giant sizes as well. Uh, it would explain maybe why some of them are in the fields. I thought that was really kind of cool. Again, just a collection of the religious things that he's found. And, and I've seen other people with, you know, you know, displays like this. It's just incredible, really, really incredible. Uh, again, same kind of buckles that the other gentleman found, but it's just his display of them is a little bit different. He likes to, you know, lay them out in these glass displays and they're, they're beautiful. My actually, my favorite one is this one coming up is this one with the uh, dragon down in the bottom. And it's like some kind of a brooch or something that be, I think a person would have worn. Uh, but way before Game of Thrones was, uh, here's a dragon for you. And I thought that was like so cool. Um, and then you see, you know, the design, many of them intact, some of them pieces, but they're just so laid out so perfectly. And the lighting I thought was, you know, exquisite lighting. It was really, really cool. And then, you know, over, over time, you, you find all kinds of stuff. So another thing, he's got a collection of locks and keys. And you do find modern junk too. I mean, you know, uh, trinkets and things that are left. Uh, these sites have been around for a long time. So you got people visiting over time and they find all kinds of stuff, modern as well as old. And he just puts it all together. He's got like an eclectic collection shelf that is all kinds of different stuff. Really, really cool. And again, it's some more uh, buckles, but nothing, you know, super, I don't want to you know, beat up the buckles, but there's so many different types and designs. It's just amazing. Um, this one was kind of interesting. A couple of features on this. I think the tomahawk-like structure, I think, was kind of cool. Some of these major things. The thing that got my attention is this thing in the back that looks like a, kind of like a jar, or kind of like a toy. And when I first saw it, I actually didn't know what it was. It was after one of the presentations in the comments. I saw someone mention that they thought it would have been like this hand toy uh, cap gun and what would happen is you take this and you put like a cap in here like you know a cap gun type of thing put some caps in here throw it up in the air and when it came down and landed on this end it would pop the caps and make it like a you know explosion type of a thing and it would be kind of fun i remember as a kid they had something similar to these like little mini versions but this is like a major version when i first saw this i thought it was like a world war one bomb uh, because um, that's i i've seen pictures like of, of in the world war one when they used to fly these uh, bombers or even the regular planes, the pilot or the co-pilot would have these bombs next to them. And they would just reach over and, and drop it off the side of the of the plane, just wherever it landed, it landed. But uh, they look like this. And that's what that's reminded me of when I first saw it. But then someone said it's probably one of those uh, like old, old toys, which I think is really kind of cool. But you look at the size of some of these things. I mean, there must have been massive signals when they got these, it's just crazy. And again, another collection of his, and it's like I was saying, it's artistic. The way he designs these is just so beautiful. You know, all the different uh, vintages, different uh, uh, types of coins, silver, you know, the mercuries, and, and, and I think he has some barbers mixed in. Uh, it's just all kinds of stuff. Our barbers mixed in up here, some seeded coins, really, really beautiful. 
And then um, one of my favorites, I have to admit, I like silver. There's no doubt everybody likes silver, I'm sure. But one of my favorites is the Indian hit penny. Someone just asked me that, like, what, which one of your favorite coins? And I said it, the Indian hit penny. Uh, when it comes out of the ground and it has that green patina on it, or it's like one that fat one, like the, you know, the real, it's something that toasties, but they're, they're uh, fatties and they're a little thicker and they're weighty. And they just look so cool uh, when they come out of the ground. And the design, I think, is exquisite. And I, I, I love the design. So I think that was really neat. And, and he made a nice little display, a smaller Riker box display of it. And I think it's a two cent piece in the middle. Um, and he's found some of these, obviously. Um, uh, I'm sure he's found many of these. Okay, another uh, display as well as I think this is just a collection of some of his coppers. And again, Connecticut doesn't do really well with coppers because they, um, the soil uh, tends to, um, to degrade them uh, quite a bit. So unfortunately, you, you get that problem with, with our coppers getting toasty. Uh, some of these, you can see the figures that are there. Uh, this um, special scent, I just lost the name of this, uh, Fujio scent, I think is what it's called, with that ring of lines around it. I think that's like the highlight, kind of like a flower in the middle. Uh, Fujio is a very collectible coin. Um, some other coins, and this is almost looks like an Asian coin uh, with the square cuts. Um, this cut coin, uh, actually in a future video, another video, I'll talk about a story with these cut coins. You know, people clipped coins are kind of interesting finds. Um, and I'll talk to you about some stories about that in a future video. But again, just a nice, beautiful collection of, of coins. Now, I brought this up because uh, it highlights a few different things that I wanted to share with you re regarding this, um, this person. And the first thing you might attract to is this huge medallion in the middle, and that's, that's huge. Uh, and so it must have been a major hit. It must have been pretty exciting to find with the chain and all. But I asked him, like, what's your favorite find? And his favorite find was actually the pocket watch that's up here. And in fact, the first gentleman that I was talking about, uh, his favorite find, he told me, was also a pocket watch. So they both had that in common, which I thought was interesting. Uh, they were both old pocket watches. They were very impressive, and they were in you know, very good shape. I mean, obviously not functioning, but very, very good shape for a pocket watch. And um, one of the things is they were both found, I believe, while they were walking alongside stone walls. So when they were alongside the stone wall, the, the imagination is that you know, someone was working, standing there, working there and sat down and maybe took a, a watch out of their pocket, put it down and then, you know, it fell out of their pocket or they, they forgot it. Uh, and it just stayed next to that stone wall over time. And then they, they found it. And that, you know, it's a really collectible piece and it's obviously a gorgeous piece of history, uh, remarkable. The other thing here that I, I like to mention, because one of my favorite things are Native American points and arrowheads. I love looking for these. And this guy is so nice, he's kind. He invited me to go specifically with him detecting to this one location uh, because he knew that I really liked looking for arrowheads. And I spend time with my sons doing that just to walk the fields. And when they, we evaluate the fields, we might as well evaluate them and look for arrowheads at the same time. Well, when we were out there finding them, he took me to a field that was a Native American site. So it was just to increase our odds. And he even told me, Wayne, that part of the field, that's where the Native American site, that's where I've gotten a lot of my arrowheads. So I knew where to kind of concentrate my walk. So that was really kind of him to share that spot with me. Uh, and then if you look here, you just got like an eclectic collection of different things. It's just really, really kind of a cool assortment of stuff that he finds. What's amazing is every month he comes to our meetings and he brings a, a box, like a Tupperware kind of a box uh, of all the things he had for that month. And it's just amazing, like every month, how many more silvers that he's found. And he, you know, he's already got a good accumulation for this year. All right, not just coins, not just buttons, um, crotobelts. I know um, Nancy, Ambient Girl Digs, if you're out there and you're watching this, you're gonna be going crazy over this because I know these are your favorite and they're mine too. I really like them a lot. Um, I don't talk about my stuff too much, but one of my favorite finds, when people ask me like favorite find, was a crotobel that I found not that long ago. It was like last year, I think it was, that it had the leather tongue still stuck in it, a little tongue. A piece of leather that was going through it that was all you know withered and, and kind of all crunchy and everything but just the thought that that was what attached this to the sleigh was really really cool to me because usually they're, they're not there they disintegrated but to find one intact on the bell itself and the bell said a little uh, clicker in it the jingle or jinglet in it whatever they call that inside uh, would ring and it was really dirty but it cleaned up really nice I, and my friend told me just warm soap and water and it cleaned up so wonderful and these are very collectible so if you find these you'll see maker marks on the bottom of them so you can see you know um, who made them and they are very very collectible wonderful items and then these all these bells and then the bottom shelf i'll show you another slide in a minute um, 
that's kind of a funny story that goes with that. These, these are the ox dubs. And my first ox dub way back, uh, I didn't know what it was. It just was a great reading. And I looked at this and it looked like I didn't know what it was. It was just like a hunk of metal with a hole in it. So it wasn't, it was too big to be a washer. So I had no idea what it was. So my friend was there and I went over to him and I said, you know what this is? This is really cool. And he looked at me and he just, oh, that's an ox dub. And then he just, just kept like walking and like no big deal. I'm like so excited. I'm saying, saying like, this is an ox dub. It's my first ox dub. It's like so cool. And then you find out they come in like all these different sizes and designs. I just thought that was really kind of cool. And then I, I like ox shoes. So he doesn't have any here. Like it's funny because like the horse tack and the ox shoes, the things that you find like a bucket of them, he actually puts them in buckets because he doesn't have any place else to put them. And one day I was setting up a museum display. I'd never told this story before, but I was setting up a museum display for the Historic Society. And I, they wanted examples of different kinds of stuff. So I went to him because I know he has all this stuff. He says, yeah, just help yourself. So he had a bucket full of like horse tack and then um, uh, ox, oxen shoes. And um, one of the things I've never seen, uh, I just found just, just like a few days ago was it, it was a baby ox. Like usually you get the ox shoes and they're like four or five, six inches big. They're pretty good sized shoes. But this one was like only like two or three inches. It was like a little teeny ox shoe. It was like a miniature ox shoe. I thought that was like the coolest thing because I'd never found one before. I think that was really cool. But he's found all kinds of stuff from bullets, musket balls. This is a little Derringer, you know, all kinds of stuff he's found. This is like crazy cool. And um, uh, a Hames knob, I think this is what uh, Sodbusters, Larry told me. I didn't realize that that's part of the um, the equipment, I guess, that um, it's part of the horse. Not, I thought it was like a giant ox, ox knob, but it's not. It's called a Haynes knob, I think is what it was called. And then again, some more bells and stuff like that. So you always learn something new. The Haynes, I think it was Haynes is what it was called. Some of you out there probably know this already, but I thought that was kind of cool. And then uh, this is like, most people would just pass this over as junk and you, you just, you found so much of it that you started making a collection of it. And it's such a beautiful display. Like he's like so artistic, you can see it. So you find these like different license tags and you, the, the old way to do the licenses, they had the tags. So he's found so many, he made this collection with a license plate with all the different dates. Um, it's just, just really, really cool, his display. You know? And then in the background, you see some of the trophies. I didn't point this out before, but like I said, he's got a ton of trophies for his uh, van restorations. So it's really, really cool. And then, like I said, he digs everything. Uh, and the interesting thing is when you get these big objects like this, sometimes you're trying to figure out what they were, what they did. But when you get names on them, like this one, and you can look up the company and, and figure out what, what it was, that's always interesting. So he's got all kinds of stuff like that. Again, collections of silverware. He's got, you know, trays and trays of silverware, a lot of pewter, some of the really early forks that were only like three prong, two prong, really interesting stuff, all kinds of different things. But uh, marbles, I just pointed out the marbles. You don't find those obviously detecting. You find them on the surface. They're, they're like sight finds because they're not going to ring. But the thing is, like, you do find them out in the field. I find them in the beach, especially like an old beach near me. Uh, I find them in the beach a lot. And you just when you're walking at low tide, you can see them. But you find them in the woods sometimes, occasionally, too, as you're walking a field. Uh, you find them. And they're just so gorgeous. I mean, the, they're, they're so perfect. And you remember, this is a kid's toy. And they were playing, and they lost it. And, and he's got a little, you know, bowl full here. It's really kind of cool. I think that's one of his favorites, too. All right. So those are my, my two major players, two different uh, types of detectors for sure. But this is something more recent. And this is some just assorted shout outs and bucket lister stuff. And this is a new friend of mine. Um, and uh, his name's Matt. He's from uh, down south. And the reason I met Matt was actually I was going to buy a detector. <laughs> and it's funny because they call me like the detector collector because I have so many detectors. I just accumulated over the years. And uh, I just like to, it's just like collect them. You know, you can never have too many fishing rods. It's like, you never have too many detectors, right? So one of the things though is um, he had for sale and I saw it on Facebook, I think it was uh, a Fisher F75. Now, a good friend of mine, one of my, one of my best friends uh, and one of the best detectors I've, I've ever detected with um, uses it religiously. And he knows that machine. It's like, he's like, we can't, he's like one with his machine. And he knows that Fisher F75 really well. And I've been so impressed by what he's found over the years with that, that when he had this for sale, I said, wow, this is a good opportunity. It was a fair price. It had a lot of good equipment with it. So I called him and, and then we started talking about it. We, we negotiated a price. And then I, I called my other friend and I said, what do you think? You know, should I get this? And he says, Wayne, do you realize how many detectors you have? You have like one for every day of the week. You don't need another detector. It's not going to really change things for you um, other than to say you have a Fisher because I never owned a Fisher before. But one of the things, and I, I bring this up because I don't often talk about detectors um, 
because that's not what this is about to me. Um, there's a lot of different brands, as you know, there's a lot of different models. There's high-end models and entry-level models and everything in between. And I don't think it's necessarily the detector. I, I know some people are gonna be insulted by that, but I'm not trying to insult you. I mean, you spend a lot of money on your detector. I'm sure it's a high quality, great detector. But I think a lot of it is knowing your detector, not necessarily the brand or the make or the model or the amount you spent on it. A lot of it might be for bells and whistles that you may never even use. But the thing is, if you know your detector, that's more important than anything. And uh, case in point, I remember just hearing this recently, there was a, a pretty famous YouTuber out there. Um, and he was noted to say that it really didn't matter on the detector. And they challenged him, I guess, on that. And they, they did like this hunt or something. He went hunting with some people that had the high-end detectors and he had you know, his average detector, whatever. And he did as well, if not better uh, than they did. So it was just to prove a point that it's not just the detector, it's the person swinging it. And also, I mean, there's some luck about it. You know, there's just having some luck. You gotta get that coil over the, the item. If you don't get the coil over it, if you're not lucky enough to do that, you're not gonna find it. So, you know, there's a lot of factors involved. But I think knowing your detector is what I'm trying to get at is, is the factor. So anyway, we started talking to my, my buddy here, Matt, and um, he was cool with me not buying the detector. He actually sold it right away to another person that had just started. And I like the fact that going to a new person that's just starting and they're getting a quality detector and they'll be able to do a lot with that, probably use it more than I ever could. So I think that's great that, you know, things happen for a reason. Well, I also met him and we became kind of like friends, just you know, conversing back and forth. He was talking about what he sees down there and he's more civil war oriented where he goes is uh, civil war. And I was telling him about a revolutionary. We started just talking about things like, you know, how he researches stuff and um, he wanted to learn some stuff. And there was some stuff I was doing that he wasn't familiar with. So I just spent some time and I taught him how to do it. And I showed him and he like, he's a quick study. Like he picked up the stuff like, you know, really, really easily. And he started finding stuff and he was like really, really happy and appreciative. So he sent me this thank you. This is February uh, 10th. Uh, a huge thank you to Wayne and his help in guiding me directly to a beautiful foundation uh, hidden out of sight for over a century. And it's using some of these techniques. I'm going to talk to you about the future and uh, game changer believer. I thought that was so cool when he said that. I was humbled when he said that. Uh, Matt K. So I'm amazing detectorist. He's an amazing guy, an amazing father. This is his son, Austin. He's nine years old, he got his first detector and his dad was telling me that he, he got his first copper and some like crazy finds already, you know, like um, artifacts and historical stuff that he's been finding at nine years old. Can you imagine what this kid's gonna find during his career? It's gonna just be ultimately amazing. You know, it's really gonna be amazing. So um, thank you, uh, Matt, it's been good to know you. I hope we can swing together someday. You come up here for revolution, I'll go down there for a civil war. I'll trade you any day. Another friend of mine, more recent friend, uh, joined our club, fairly new detectorist. One of the, um, he, he's, he's just got like this natural skill, natural sense, I don't know, mantra, I don't know. He, he's just got the Cujo. He, he, he's just really good at what he does. And uh, he spends a lot of time with it and he works at it. But he was getting frustrated because, you know, whenever you first start off, you, you imagine that you're going to be finding all this great stuff and you see other people finding this great stuff. And you, you wonder like, what's, what are you doing wrong? And um, he, he, he wanted some help. So it was he and a friend of his, uh, another good friend that's now a friend of mine as well. Um, they, they asked to spend some time with me and I spent time teaching them some of these techniques that we're gonna talk about. And um, he was really happy with it. And um, again, I was humbled by his kind words. It was a uh, thank you, Wayne, for showing me the techniques that have produced some of my best finds. Uh, Cliff M. March just, just recently, he did this. But um, what happened, the story behind this is I, I brought him to a cellar hole that I had been researching, I had found, I drove by to check it out with my son, actually, we walked it and it looked promising. And I wanted to bring him and Jerry, um, the other guy to this site because uh, Jerry was still looking for his first large scent or copper and um, Cliff likes to find old stuff and he's been very, very fortunate. They've, they've found bucket lists that are people's list already and they've only been doing this a short time. So they've been pretty lucky, but they wanted to find you know more and better stuff. So that's cool. So we went to this uh, cellar hole. Jerry couldn't go that day. It was just Cliff and I. And we started doing the cellar hole. And unfortunately, right away, you could tell there was some issues. And that was that it had been hit before. And the reason we could tell was that there was a lot of iron that they left in the hole. So like big pieces of iron. Someone dug it up and they left it there. Uh, doing the perimeter was pretty scarce. Even with nails, it was pretty scarce. 
But I, I still thought the area was promising because it was a beautiful area, flat area around. So I said, okay, let's expand out our search. So you go that way, I go this way. So he just walked in his way. And he's like really, like I said, he has this native ability to kind of like find a spot. So he went out into the woods and I went this way. And then all of a sudden I hear, hey, Wayne, come here, I got something good. So I was like, okay. So I, I kind of like, you know, ran over uh, and I'm looking and he's he's got this hand open and he's got this like glass bottle in his hand with a metal top. And I'm looking at it, it's like this little teeny bottle. And I didn't know what it was. I honestly didn't know what it was. And he take the top off and we're thinking, we're talking. And he said, that's probably like an inkwell. And it was like so cool. The, the glass was like really um, textured. It was really, really pretty. Uh, and I knew it would clean up well. I mean, it was really nasty there. It was like, full of dirt. It was really nasty looking. So then we, we, we stood around that area and it turned out that he probably found a, a, not a full cellar hole because it didn't have any of the stones, but there was a depression. So it might've been a pre-site pre be, before people built their regular homes with the stones and everything, they had to live somewhere. That's probably where they lived. I did find some pewter stuff, some like a spoon or a fork or something. Uh, so there was some other evidence of people who had been in that area. So it was promising. About six inches from where he found this one, he got another hit and he dug and it was like a persistent hit and he dug it and it was the mate for that first uh, inkwell. So he had the pair and I'm, I'm standing there like only a few feet away and I was like, oh, Cliff, I was so jealous because they were so beautiful. I just wanted one of them and um, he had both. So I was like so happy for him. And then afterwards he cleaned them up. He let me take a picture of him holding them. And you can see in this picture, I found an image of it. Um, it's just so gorgeous, so ornate. Again, uh, historical. I, I was checking the dates on it. I want to say, um, I want to say late 1700s or 1800s. I'm not can't, can't remember the date off the top of my head, but it, it's definitely historic, and it was uh, in line with the with the site that we were at. So it was really really cool. So congratulations, Cliff and uh, and Jerry. You know the good news after that is uh, Jerry went to another site, um, uh, another site. I think I might have turned him on to too. I can't remember. Uh, and he got his um his he got his first copper. So he was really appreciative. He wrote me a nice little um, um shout out too. Um, so I appreciate the testimonials from these guys. But these are people like you and I. I mean, they're just detectorists that you know love love the hobby. And they just learned a few of these tools that I'm going to be teaching you. And this is what's happened. So, you know, it can be done for anybody. This is real. And um, uh, just uh, kind of like the last couple of slides here. I just wanted to show a bucket list. Here. I wish it was mine and it's not, uh, but I get to hold it. So that's about probably the next best thing. And some of you know him, uh, Hollywood Joe, uh, an amazing guy, really amazing guy. He's, he's well known uh, on the internet and different YouTube circles. Uh, with the Copperheads, it's a group that he hunted with and he's part of. Uh, also, more recently, with um, Nancy, Ambient Girl Digs, and Digging Life. Um, they gave me the, my first break. It was my first internet um, um, talk was on their show. It was on a live stream for them. Um, it was supposed to be an hour-long show, and I, I told them, I, I can't do it in an hour. And they said, there's no problem. Just you know, talk as long as you need. So I, like two hours later, I was still talking. And, and the audience was still there. So I was kind of in, really happy that they were staying and they were listening to it. And I, I could have talked, probably kept going, but you know, we had to end up stopping at some point. And then um, I guess this other gentleman, uh, Larry Rivera from uh, Sodbusters, um, was either in attendance or heard about it and knew something. So he invited me more recently to do his live stream. And he says, wait, no problem. You know, you got a couple hours because I, I, I warned him. I said, you know, I, I can talk. And uh, Joe makes fun of me because I talk a lot. But then he, he and that's part of the educator in me, right? So um, I got to Larry's show and it was like, I, I realized now it was like two and a half hours later. And I really hadn't finished everything that I wanted to say or all the stories and the techniques or techniques I'd even talk about because you just were running out of time. So that's what made me think to do this series with you. Like um, this was like our introductory ep episode, but then I'm going to do a series of additional episodes, um, trying to do them one a week. So then I can space it out and make it easier for people to digest. I'm already started working on the next one, which I, I someone asked me to do something like you know, starting from scratch, like how do you actually start the whole process? So, and, you know, instead of jumping too far ahead into like these advanced methods, you know, try to put everyone on the same playing field. I think the next uh, episode is going to be more like um, uh, game changing 101, you know, research methods, maybe 101. How do you get started with all this? Because you got to start somewhere. So I, it may be basic for some of you and, and for others, it might be the first time you heard it. 
But like I said, for anything, um, when, you, when you're teaching something or, or sharing something, if you get one gem, one thing that you didn't know or one thing you find interesting, I think it's worth it. So hopefully you'll feel that way. And if not that episode, I hope there'll be another episode that you like, but then there'll be like a series of short episodes. I'm really excited about it. I have a lot of the content. I just haven't organized it yet because I'm still learning all this stuff uh, on how to post this and, and create it for the, um, for the YouTube channel. Um, so anyway. Um, so I hope you're now excited as I am to, to share this stuff with you uh, and to learn, you know, um, many of these things were found using the techniques that I'm going to be teaching you or sharing with you. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to do that. So again, uh, I'm just going to wrap up. Uh, I'm curious to know what your game changer is. So some of you might be skeptical out there and I would totally understand that, you know, um, is this real? Yeah, this is real. The stuff I'm going to show you is real. The techniques are real. You have to learn them. Um, there's no magic. There's no guarantee that you're going to find stuff because you use these techniques. And there isn't any, I, I may have said this before, but it's important to mention, there isn't just one research method or one technique that you can use that's going to be like the, 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 the go-to for everything because it depends on the site. It depends on what you're looking for, what's available to you. Not all of the research tools that we'll talk about are available to everyone. So you have to make the best of what you do have and maybe a combination of things. So that's when I refer to the research toolbox because you wanna have the right tool for the job. If you've ever done a job and you had the wrong tool, you know how much more effort it is to try to get that job done when you have the wrong tool. So if you have a whole bunch of tools to use and you can pick that from your toolbox and I can give you a few more for your toolbox, that's what this is really about. And if it works, then you're gonna see some game changer results. That's what this is, all right? Now, if you like this kind of stuff, uh, this is my shout out to my Facebook group. Uh, it's a non-commercial site. It's a private group just to keep people's uh, information private. But if you apply, you'll be, you know, you're accepted to the group. There's no, you just have to agree to the, uh, the rules, which are just to be nice to each other. Um, and then you'll be in the group. And we're growing. I don't think we've hit 200 members yet. I, I was hoping to get 200 members, but we just started a few weeks ago. Um, but it's growing word of mouth, you know, and that's what this is about. But the, the basis of this is to be informal and informative, have some fun in the process. So I try to do different things, try to keep things posting. But it's really not about my posting things for people. It's about sharing. And that's what this whole idea is that I had was this group would be a game changing group of people that want to share their passion for this hobby and not be afraid to share ideas and, and things that have worked for them. So for everyone's benefit. And that's what, what it's about. So if you're interested, please join. I mean, if you have a phone and you can see this uh, QR code, just scan the QR code, hold your phone up to it. It'll take you to the group. Or just remember metal detecting uh, game changer uh, and it will take you to our group page. And like I said, I would welcome you all. Uh, we have this pirate theme just to let you know. We do have a pirate theme on the group. And that's just because um, one of the things that I do is I'm a hunt master for the Nutmeg Club. And I help out in the other club when I can. But um, as a hunt master, I like to, to do different, you know, different kinds of hunts. We often do like a beach hunt. So this time around, I had the idea to do a pirate beach hunt. Because how many times do you get to be like a pirate and uh, dig up buried treasure? So I bought some pirate coins and I buried them. I bought some pirate chess and I buried pirate chess so that people could have some fun doing it. Again, one group got really excited about it um, because, uh, you know, it was fun. There was a different theme. Uh, the other group just wanted the token so they could change it in for prizes, which is silver prizes, silver dimes. But uh, one group got so into it, like they actually wore pirate costumes. I, I wore a pirate costume to get into the, into the feel of it too. And um, one person said to me, Wayne, I, I don't want the silver coins. I just want the pirate tokens. Is that okay if I keep them? I said, sure, absolutely. If you want to, they're fake, they're not real. But if you want them and you want to keep them, that's cool. And I, I really appreciate it. And uh, those are big successes for us, uh, those two hunts. So I'm hoping they'll be coming like an annual hunt for us. Um, so, you know, if, if you're out there doing hunts and you want to give your group some ideas um, and, and they, or they want some tips on, on how to do a group hunt, uh, we've got some really cool stuff. Um, our, our club president's really creative in, in doing different kinds of club hunts. We do a night hunt uh, with like little headlights on at night. That's kind of fun. Uh, so there's lots of different stuff you can do to keep it interesting. Um, so thank you again. I don't want to keep talking because I can talk nonstop. Uh, thank you for attending. I look forward to seeing you hopefully again in our next episode. As I said, we're going to kind of be progressive here and keep moving along, maybe smaller chunks of time. Um, and I just want to wish you well, uh, uh, happy hunting in coils of the sand and soil 
for both our um, uh, men and women that go out and beach hunt. I haven't forgotten you. Um, I'm actually adding a new episode uh, just about beach hunting. Um, and there's some really cool stories about that that I'll share. Uh, I've met some people that are just amazing uh, masters of the beach. And uh, I'll be um, sharing those as well. And uh, the, the interesting thing, this picture that I ended with here is actually at the end of my street. Um, where I live is down near the shoreline. And um, it's such a beautiful beach area and the sunsets are so natural. People often ask me, wait, why are you going out into like the deep woods, driving two hours of, you know, so like into the New York and all these other places when you got this in your, in, in your backyard? Um, I mean, I truly enjoy this and I love doing the beach as well. It's been hit pretty hard, but it is a really old beach and, and doing the research, you know, tie that in, doing the research, um, the original association, I think was like in the 1930s, but it was obviously a beach before then. So they found Native American points here. I, I actually found a Native American point last year on this beach, which was I thought was really cool. And some really old coins. Uh, they get really toasted in the salt water, but I found some really cool stuff there. And uh, I brought my friends here as well. And um, they've actually found more stuff here than I have. Uh, but it's a really cool place to, to hang out. And that's it. So again, thank you. I appreciate your time uh, being here today. And I hope you got something out of it. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, this is take two. I, I hope I didn't offend anyone in take one. Um, like I said, I, 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 I'm trying to make people happy here. And um, thank you for your patience with this. And I hope to see you really soon. All right, take care.